Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about XX70 motherboard pricing, um, because MSI has revealed their prices to the public. I also have some information from other manufacturers, however, I cannot share it with you directly. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, we're mostly going to be focusing on MSI's pricing here, and we're going to talk a little bit about why it is that motherboards keep getting more and more expensive. Um, but before we get to that, let's talk about the $1,300 elephant in the room, also known as the X670E Godlike. How is this board $1,300? Well, that is very, very simple. It's not because it's super expensive to manufacture this board, though I'm assuming that they're only making a couple thousand of these. So the manu- like, and a couple thousand motherboards is low volume production. Like, um, yeah, like that, that is not a good volume for producing a motherboard. So that would be part of it. But the main reason this motherboard is $1,300 is because MSI has made the calculation that there's a couple thousand people on this planet who are willing to pay $1,300 for a motherboard, and therefore they should be allowed to do that. Those people are idiots. But they do exist, and uh, MSI is going to sell this board to them. So uh, props to MSI on like discovering this great like source of profit because right? <laughs> it's like that's is really all that it, all it is with this price tag like um and the thing is msi probably has great information on uh how many people are willing to pay thirteen hundred dollars for a motherboard because there's the z690 godlike which was twelve hundred dollars so i imagine they sold enough of this thing that they were like well if we raise the price a hundred dollars the people who are willing to pay twelve hundred dollars for a motherboard are probably going to be completely okay with paying $1,300 for a motherboard too, right? Because, like, these people evidently don't know how much a motherboard is supposed to cost um, or what they're paying for. But anyway, uh, yeah, so that's why it's $1,300 is there's just a bunch of people who are willing to pay $1,300 for a motherboard. Uh, it also works kind of as a good, like, marketing stunt because if you literally have one of the most expensive motherboards on the market, it makes your brand look more premium which is uh, stupid as hell, but consumers are idiots. So yeah, that like actually works on some people. If you just have a higher price tag than all of your competitors, some people are just going to automatically assume that your product must be better. And it certainly is a more premium product because like, as far as I know, the definition of premium is just expensive. So uh, yeah, that, that works. That, that is a thing. Uh, which is very unfortunate, because I would not be surprised if some other manufacturer decided to, uh, you know, take the premium, uh, na like, premium brand uh, perception away from MSI by, re by releasing an even more expensive motherboard. So if there's a $1,400 X670 motherboard, that's why. It's because MSI <laughs> released a $1,300 motherboard, so somebody else was like, well, we're not going to be cheaper than MSI. We need to be more expensive than MSI, right? Because MSI is like an inferior brand or whatever, so we must have a more expensive product than they do. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's how like ultra high end, uh, like it's, this isn't even ultra high end pricing. This is just idiot pricing. Like that, like, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't have any... Because, like, yeah, like, the only really unique feature that this board has that I find kind of interesting is that it does have a 10-layer PCB, which might translate into slightly better memory overclocking capabilities than the rest of MSI's lineup. However, I really doubt that because it's also entirely possible to take an 8-layer memory topology and just slap two more layers on it without doing anything. In which case, this would clock memory exactly the same as everything else does. And also, this has too many DIMM slots. And last I checked, having more layers does not circumvent the fact that unpopulated, or should I say unterminated, DIMM slots are a source of uh, interference for high-speed signals. Uh, which is why all of the real extreme overclocking motherboards only come with one DIMM per channel. Not four, not, you know, two DIMMs per channel, because uh, it's bad for signal quality. This, this is. So, uh, yeah. Um... So that's why this board's $1,300. It's, it's basically, it's a marketing stunt, and there's some idiots out there who will pay $1,300 for a motherboard, so, you know, MSI is just kind of taking advantage of the fact. Um, and, you know, they also have great, they probably have evidence that this works. 
because they had a $1,200 motherboard before, so if they're raising the price, evidently they sold plenty of those, which is depressing to think about, but yeah. Anyway, what about motherboards that are supposed to be, like you know, what about motherboards that sort of more directly reflect their actual manufacturing cost rather than their marketability or marketing value? I'm, I'm really not sure what to say about the godlike. Now, the Ace, I wouldn't consider that because... I've looked at the feature set and, like, the specs of this thing, and I still can't figure out why it's $700. Um, yeah, like, I, I'm having a hell of a time figuring out why this is $700. It's more expensive than its predecessor, which had basically the same feature set. And I already didn't like the price of the Z690 Ace because I thought it was too high relative to the features that it offers. So this thing is just like, well, now it's even more expensive and it still basically does the same thing. Like it still has an eight layer PCB. It still has some PCIe Gen 5 switches. Um, this doesn't even have Thunderbolt, but it does have three USB type C ports. This had, you know, it's had Thunderbolt. Admittedly, they did switch over from dual two and a half gig LAN to 10 gig LAN. But the thing about 10 gig LAN is you can get a 10 gig LAN card for like a hundred bucks. And then you can stick it on your $300 motherboard and you can get 10 gig LAN functionality for like half the price. Okay, well, close to half the price, right? Um, actually, I think if you search long and hard enough for a 10 gig LAN card, you might be able to get one for like 70 bucks and then it would be literally half the price. So I've, yeah, I've not figured out why this board is $700, but um, I guess maybe this thing is trying to like ride the, like fall, like, follow the godlike pricing where it's like you know like somebody might somebody who considers themselves an enthusiast sees the godlike and goes like well i'm not paying 1300 dollars for a motherboard but this is 700 dollars, and my previous board was 500 dollars, so you know this isn't too bad and it's like nah you're still an idiot anyway so now let's take a look at motherboards that kind of make sense so we have the Carbon uh, X670e Carbon Wi-Fi. Why is this thing so damn expensive? Well, that's very simple. Actually, maybe we should... No, we should start with this. Because this board, it's a bit more complicated because it actually has less PCIe Gen 5. Like, yeah, this is just a bunch of Gen... Actually, it's not even a bunch of Gen 4. Yeah, there's not really a whole lot of PCIe Gen 4 as far as I'm concerned. Um... Anyway, but this right here has a bunch of PCIe Gen 5. More importantly, it has PCIe Gen 5 switches, which are very, very expensive. Um, like, literally the cheapest Z690 motherboard that I'm aware of that has PCIe Gen 5 switches on it is $400. So this is more expensive than that, um, but this also has more PCIe Gen 5 as now we have, like, Gen 5 for, like, the M.2 slots, Gen 5 for the dual X8, and then you have Gen 5 also for the X4 slot at the bottom. Um, and the thing with PCIe Gen 5 is just it is very expensive. The PCIe switches are very expensive. Like, the crazy thing to me about Gen 5 PCIe switches is they're actual BGA devices, which BGA packaging is only used when absolutely necessary because it's just inherently more expensive than other methods of connecting chips to boards so that should give you some idea of just like yeah pcie gen 5 just sends the cost of a motherboard through the roof another thing that is a problem with pcie gen 5 is that the signals are running so fa well the switches are on freaking bga because the signals are so fast but um the PCB material that is used on Gen 5 capable motherboards uh, is uh, just better than what you, and more expensive than what was used for like PCIe 4.0 and PCIe 3.0 boards, because at the speeds that Gen 5 runs at, if you tried to run a Gen 5 signal through a, uh, like, let's say a PCIe 3.0 motherboard, that signal will get massively attenuated after just a couple centimeters of distance through the PCB, because of the electrical properties of the, the PCB material. So I don't have specifics on which exact PCB substrates are being used for Gen 5 motherboards, but it's more expensive than what was used on PCIe 3.0 motherboards. Um, at the very least, they're using much more consistent fiberglass weaves because the inconsistent, like the inconsistent fiberglass weaves aren't really a problem on uh, low speed signals, but for Gen 5, for PCIe Gen 5, they're, they're a problem. 
Then there's other costs like the PCIe slots themselves are now SMT instead of through-hole. And the reason this is done is, again, signal integrity. So that adds some cost. Now, admittedly, going from through-hole uh, PCIe slots to SMT PCIe slots isn't a huge jump in cost because it's just, you know, like it's still basically a piece of plastic with metal pins coming off of it. The pins just have a different shape. However, it is a, you know, it is a cost increase. It's not free. Um, and there's a lot of little things like that that go into it, right? Like the PCB material is a bit more expensive than it used to be. The PCIe slots are a bit more expensive than they used to be. The PCIe switches are insanely expensive compared to PCIe 3.0 or 4.0 switches. And actually PCIe 4.0 switches were also ridiculously expensive because you also needed re-drivers afterwards, which the PCIe Gen 5 switches, as far as I know, just integrate that because, um... Yeah, PCIe Gen 5 signals really don't travel very far on their own, so they need a lot of help. And uh, then you also have things like USB Type-C ports, which, fun fact, are just more expensive than Type-A ports. Not, again, by a huge amount, but they are more expensive. And the thing is, so you have a lot of these little things that are just like, well, you know... Oh, and then, like, DDR5 DIMM slots are SMT. They're more expensive than through-hole DIMM slots that were used on DDR4. So that's kind of the thing, is just, like, a lot of the sort of, like, speed improvements that we see in motherboards, right? Like, the higher, the, like, basically the high-speed I.O. that we're getting on newer and newer boards, they're not coming, like, the, these new, faster, you know, connect, like, connectivity options, they're not coming due to, like, clever design optimizations of cheap materials to get higher performance, they're coming from just using better materials that cost more. Um, and that's just driving up the, the cost of motherboards overall. Uh, fun fact, LGA sockets are also more expensive than PGA sockets. Um, and I would not be surprised if the AMD socket was more expensive than the Intel socket, just because it does have a somewhat more substantial uh, backplate and uh, also the, the plastic tabs. Like, it's not going to be a huge difference, but this does seem to just be a more substantial socket mechanically. Uh, then also the fact that X670 has two chipsets instead of one. Um, that probably adds some amount of manufacturing cost. Um, and uh, yeah, like, that, that's how even a motherboard that's supposed to be like a basic option, like the X670-P, ends up being $290. And I've got bad news. I am not aware of any X670 motherboards costing less than $290, right? And this doesn't even have a bunch of PCIe Gen 5 running everywhere. This is just PCIe 4.0, and it's $290. Um, but it does have more Type-C ports than its predecessor. It also comes with Wi-Fi wi 6E. I would imagine they could maybe release a non-Wi-Fi 6E version for like 260 200 yeah 260 270 dollars because as far as i know the wi-fi 6e thing is like at least the way the motherboard manufacturers generally treat it i don't know how much it actually costs as like for for, for the motherboard vendors to add the wi-fi 6e but what it usually does to the price tag of a motherboard is they just slap a plus 20 dollar price increase right if you look at the z690 boards um you can kind of see that with the like dash a ddr4 which doesn't have Wi-Fi versus the Dash A DDR4 with Wi-Fi, which is $229 uh, before the sale, right? So actually that's a $10 price difference there. Um, though I don't think this one is 6E, is it? Yeah, this is Wi-Fi 6, whereas the 6E version would be the DDR5 board, right? Yeah, this one has Wi-Fi 6E instead of 6. And that's 209 versus 229. Actually, no, it is. is a, it's just a flat $20 price increase. Um, so potentially we could maybe see a $270 uh, X670 board from MSI if they decide to release a non-Wi-Fi version. But that's kind of the thing is just like a lot of the like innovation in motherboards now is just like, well, it costs more. <laughs> It's like, how are you getting these amazing PCIe speeds to work? Well, we just use a more expensive PCB than ever before. Uh, also, this thing's eight layers. Uh, for comparison, the cheapest Z690 board that had an eight-layer PCB uh, is, at least from MSI, was is the Z690 Carbon. 
or the force, um, which these are sort of the same thing. And also, you know, this is a sale price right now. So yeah, previously, like your cheapest eight layer PCB with gen five, uh, like capable substrate material, which actually is basically all Z690 motherboards. Um, cause they all do PCIe gen five, but anyway, like your cheapest, you know, eight layer Z690 board was like $380, $370. Um, for X670, you know, we now have a $290 board with an eight layer PCB. Um, and it does still have some PCIe Gen 5. It's just dedicated to an M.2 slot. So I guess if you are a file copying enthusiast, that's great. Um, anyway, so yeah, some of the, like, you know, the ultra high end, I'm don't, I, I, I can't. Here's the thing, because I like ultra high end motherboards. I like my Apex boards and my Unify X boards and, uh, you know, Tachyons and Darks and uh, OC formulas. I don't consider that, like, this is not an ultra high end price tag. This, this is a, a whale price tag, you know? So, uh, yeah, like this is a whale price, not an ultra high end price. <laughs> this is a whale board. Um, and that's, that's kind of the thing is like, so yeah, like the, the pricing of the, like the very, very expensive boards does not reflect manufacturing cost in the slightest. It is literally just how much are, are like, how much are people willing to pay and how many of these boards will we have to make? Um, so yeah, evidently that like evidently this works because uh, MSI hasn't lowered the price from from the Z690 version, um, which uh, yeah, so that's great. Um, and what else is there to say? That's that's kind of it. So ultimately, if you actually want like a good performance per dollar, si oh, I guess I should mention that in terms of actual like memory overclocking, all of these boards, well, with the exception of the godlike, should actually behave the same because they all use the same memory topology. Uh, or at least they should because they all use an eight layer PCB. And the way it generally works with motherboard manufacturers, if you design one good memory topology, just copy paste it. Right, just copy paste it onto every motherboard with that layer count because it drastically simplifies like BIOS support and just development in general. Um, you don't want to have a bunch of different memory topologies in your lineup because that means some boards have like completely different memory controller requirements, like memory controller configuration requirements compared to other boards. So that's ter like that's not a good idea. Um, ideally, you have the same topology on every single board. Um, except when the boards have different layer counts, in which case you have no choice but to have different topologies. Um, but uh, yeah, so also like CPU performance wise, like you're not gonna get more performance out of a $700 motherboard compared to a $300 motherboard. Like you just won't, not at stock settings. Like, yeah, um, this isn't like some, you know, hyper cost optimized motherboard where like the VRM heat sinks cost too much so that it doesn't come with them. Like this is a solid motherboard here in terms of, you know, heat sink actually it has more substantial heat sinks than its Z690 predecessors, right? Uh, which again, also a uh, bit more cost, right? Like there's, <laughs> there's a lot of little things on this board which are slightly more expensive than they used to be. Um, and so now the board is $290, but I would imagine most of that is the dual chipsets. Um, yeah. Or at least a lot of that is the dual chipsets. The other things are relatively minor compared to Z690 boards. And then of course with the carbon Wi-Fi like that's just there's a lot of Gen 5. Gen 5 is expensive. Um but yeah, in terms of CPU performance, like I would just wait for B650, right? Like you don't need to buy an X670 motherboard. Uh personally, like I my favorite benching boards are all B550 boards. Okay, like I have a lot of high-end X570 motherboards. My go-to memory overclocking boards are B550 boards, not X670 motherboards. Why? Because it doesn't make a difference. And actually the B550 boards in some ways are just better, which sounds insane, but it's true. Um, so yeah, like the price of a motherboard 
has like past a certain point like there, there's obviously motherboards that are literally pushing the limits of how cheap it can be because there's a fixed cost in the price of things like the chipset the socket right the like the connectors there's a fixed cost in those things um which is why like your uber 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 cheap motherboards will only have like two dim slots and like one pcie slot because the plastic of the pcie slot itself is just too damn expensive at that point to include uh, of like an extra pcie slot is just too much expense to include on such a low-end motherboard um but yeah, like, so, you know, obviously if you keep lowering the price at some point, you are going to get motherboards that can't support the full power consumption of the CPU because heat sinks are expensive and VRM components are expensive if in, you know, large enough quantities or, well, like the, the yeah, you're, you get what I'm trying to say, right? But past a certain point, you're not paying for like better performance like there's a there's a you know there's diminishing returns to how much better a motherboard can be and i'd say from a like purely cpu perspective like cpu performance perspective you can hit that point at around well with x670 it's like 300 dollars um but with like am4 it's around 200 dollars like past 200 actually even below that potentially so because there's like $150 B550 boards, which will run a 5950X beautifully. Um, like, in fact, one of the best voltage regulate, like one of the best, I, I did take some oscilloscope measurements of uh, of AM4 motherboards recently. One of the best motherboards I measured was a, is like $160. Straight up the best at $160. I have $200 motherboards, $300 motherboards with worse voltage regulation than that board. Admittedly, those more expensive boards have lower VRM temperatures, but uh, as long as the VRM isn't overheating, the CPU will run at the same speed, so doesn't matter. Uh, and if you're overclocking, you want better voltage regulation. That's the number one priority. Um, anyway, so past a certain point, the price of a motherboard doesn't do anything. Um, in terms of features, they tend to plateau around the $500 point. That's where you can, like at $500, you can generally find a motherboard with 10 gig LAN, with dual X8 PCIe slots, with, you know, more connectors than you'll really know what to do with. And that tends to happen around $500. That's where you get like, the motherboard does everything and there's really nothing more you could really want from it. And once you go past $500, we've got motherboards for the insane people, um, is what we've got. So, uh... Yeah, with the exception of some, like, uber high-end extreme overclocking boards, like, say, the uh, Z690 Dark from EVGA. But, like, I'd argue the main problem with the Dark boards is they're very low production volumes. Um, I can't imagine that they, like, produce very many of them. Because one dim per channel motherboards, even though they're just better at memory overclocking, at least as long as the memory topology doesn't get screwed up by somebody, um the like they don't sell very much um because a lot of people for some reason think that someday they will want to install 128 gigs of ram on their in their system and so they really need four dim slots um anyway there that's that's everything i wanted to say in this video and it ended up being way longer than it needed to be but well that's just how it is on this channel so yeah uh, thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. Um, I also have a Teespring store. There's a, well, merch store. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's like shirts and hoodies and posters, you know, the usual. And I also have a Bandcamp. There's a link to that down in the description below as well. So yeah, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.